بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم صلى الله تعالى على سيدنا محمد طب القلوب ودوائها وعافيه الابدان وشفائها ونور الابصار وضياها وقوت الارواح وغذائها وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين برحمتك يا ارحم الراحمين welcome to this program sponsored by Ranavashio and our uh with the hard work of our brother steam brother um Safir Ahmed and brother Najib and we are honored to have uh Sidi Uludamani with us uh i benefited immensely from I call him a teacher because I benefited immensely from his article that he wrote on the Persian poetry, the logic of the birds, and also from just being with him even for a few minutes because the Persian, they say, uh, they say there's a beautiful proverb. They say, Sad zadana zargar, yag zadana ohangar. A hundred uh, small little hammer of the goldsmith and one hammer of the ironsmith. So with some people, you really don't need to spend a lot of time, just a few minutes will inspire you. So we're honored to have him with us, a man of humility and a man of beauty, uh, mashallah. Um, poetry is interesting because what separates the poets from other writers? So somebody writes prose beautifully, you can read it and you enjoy it. Why is poetry in a league of its own? Uh, the highest station that you can achieve in Islamic society and Islamic uh, when, when you look at the, the Muslim world and how we have this uh, different places and stations for people. The highest is a person, what we call an adib, a person of adab, who masters adab. And if you look at the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who is the, the model that we all emulate, he said, Adabani Rabbi fa ahsana ta'adibi. Allah has taught me adab and how beautiful he has taught it to me. So in our tradition, adibs are the highest that we put on the pedestal, people of adab. What the poets do, which is interesting, because the word adab is, uh, is comportment, it's, you know, but what it really means is to put things in their proper places. That's what adab is. So if you go to somebody's home, right, and the home is really beautiful to you, is because they put everything in their proper places, right? So if you're in the living room and there's a refrigerator in there, although a refrigerator is beautiful, but it doesn't fit there. It should be in the kitchen. So it's not, it's, they, they didn't put it in the proper place. It doesn't look beautiful. So what the poet do, they put the words in their proper places. That's the secret of the poet. And that's why it engenders in us when we read it, oh, when you, why don't we say that when we read a prose? We don't say those. You know, people say, oh my God, my hair is rising when you read a line of poetry because the sequence of words have adab. And adab is something that every tradition honors. Doesn't matter what, uh, race you belong to, what, what religion you belong to, what color of skin you have. It doesn't matter. If somebody has adab, everybody honors that person and you feel at home with the people of adab. And that's what they bring really in reality to teach us adab and make us human being at the highest level. In Mawlana Rumi, in, in the Diwana Shams, they, you know, Di Sheikh Bacharag Hami Gash Girdashah, Kaz Di Wadad Malulamu in Sona Morazust. He said there was a sheikh with a, uh, with a light and he's going around the city and he's looking. And he said, I'm so tired of these animals and predator. Um, I, I, I wish to see a human being. Goftan kiyof mi nashava gashtayimma. So the people of town said, we can't find human. We have searched everywhere for them. They, you can't find them. Goftan kiyof mi nashava onamorazust. I'm seeking for the one that you can't find. Because they're rare. They're rare. The people of Adab are rare. But when you find them, one of them is equivalent to a million. They are the iron hammer. That one of them is like a nation. And this is why the Quran says, Ibrahim salam was a nation, a millah. Right? So these poets, they come to teach us. But at the, at the heart of what they're trying to teach is Adab. Because without adab, you can't fall in love. Without adab, you can't learn. Right? Why does Murumi start his book, Bishnau? Bishnau as nay, chun hikayat mi konat. Listen 
to the name, to this fluid, to this perfect human being, because it's telling your story. The reason why I start with Vishnu, listen, because listening is the adab of learning. Listening is the adab of learning. You can't speak while you're learning. You have to listen. The first, in the sama, wal basar, wal fuad. That's what the Quran is saying. First the hearing, right? Then the sight. That's the first thing that's developed in the womb is the hearing. So we listen and through listening, we learn. So we are here to, uh, inshallah, discuss some beautiful things. But he sent a poem, a few poems last night, which I, I, I looked at it this morning when I was driving here. And, and I told him, you send a, a bunch of Arabic and, and Farsi poems. Uh, I said, you send one of my favorite poems in there. Is it, is, in your collection, and he said, which one? So we were talking about that. So I'm going to start with that poem of, Sorry. of Hafiz Shirazi, and I'm going to throw it back to him. Hafiz says, and I'll read, he says, Chubishnavi sokhane ahle del magu ki khatast. Sokhan shanaz nei jahane man. Khata injast. And I'll turn that to you. Yeah, thank you, mashallah, alhamdulillah. It's tough to follow that hammer, iron smith, <laughs> uh, hammer strike. Uh, but the, the translation of this is when you hear the speech of the people of the heart, don't say that it's wrong. Um, it, rather, the mistake, my dear, John Iman Hafez says, is that you're, is you're not understanding this speech. And so when you, if you ever, particularly Persian poetry, but a lot of the Arabic Sufi poetry as well too, when you turn to it, it's full of wine, it's full of women, it's full of young boys, it's full of monasteries, Zoroastrian fire temples, Hindu temples, all of the stuff. And you, if you're reading this as a kind of contemporary, pious, neo-traditional Muslim, you'll be like, what's, are these guys even Muslim? They're talking about downing flagons of wine in the Zoroastrian temple. Uh, what's, what's, what's going on? And Hafez is, is, is saying, no, no, it's, they're not speaking incorrectly. The problem is your understanding. Uh, so with these very, very profound poets, you have to kind of understand the way that they see the world. Um, and I, I t tell my students when you're reading particularly Sufi poetry, but it applies even beyond Sufi poetry. Um, people at that, scholars at this time have called this a kind of anagogic consciousness, right? So if everything is an ayatullah, right? Everything is a reflection. Everything is a sign of God. Everything is connected back to God. And therefore everything is connected to every other thing. Right? And if everything's connected to every other thing, what poetry does is it traces out these connections and it reveals these connections to show you how things are connected to each other and how they're connected back to God. It will show you ugly things, it will show you beautiful things, but it will make all of it beautiful. It will do these connections in such a way that it makes everything beautiful. It will help you see the beauty in everything so that find them at well or wherever you turn, there's the face of God. You'll be able to see the face of God in everything and God is beautiful, and Allah, Jamal, 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 you'll be able to see the beauty in everything. And that seeing the beauty in everything is a profound act of worship, uh, which poetry really cultivates in you. Now, this, these connections between everything is also related to the actual word for poetry in Arabic, shir, and you know, all these other Islamic languages. Shir, you know, means poetry, but it comes from the same root as sha'ar, hair. Right, so these subtle, fine filaments connections connecting you and me and lights and the moon and the face of a beloved and this and that. Poetry traces out these subtle connections. Even more than that, in Arabic, the, the, the root of shir is shu'ur, which is a kind of subtle perception. Right, so if you can, like, you can tell somebody's looking at you, you know, without turning around, that, that kind of subtle perception, that feeling, that's shu'ur. Right, and poetry is based on this deep intuition of the profound connections between things, which then people make traditions of and get stock images. Um, so when you're looking at things like wine, all these other images that, that, that appear in poetry, I, I try to tell my students, you have to read in 3D. Everything that's going on in Sufi Ghazals, for example, but even beyond Sufi Ghazals, like the one we had here of, of, of Hafez, is referring to realities on the microcosmic level that is within the human being on the macrocosmic level that's out there in the world, and then also on the metacosmic level that is in the law with God. So anytime you hear of something, let's say wine, beautiful face, uh, tress, 
it refers not just to, yes, it refers to what's going on out there in the macrocosmic world. It also refers to an inner reality in the human being as well as a reality in divinus. And if you learn to read and, and not just read, but then ultimately you start to see the world in this way as well, so it's profoundly transformative. And that's what these traditions of poetry have been doing for in general. One of the interesting things that happens with, uh, the Arabs had an incredible poetic tradition of Qasidas, you know, the, the Mu'alakat, these incredible poems. But when the revelation comes, you see a transformation in the Jahili tradition and you suddenly get this explosion of love poetry. In the first generation of Muslims, people are reciting, some people aren't happy about it, but a lot of the Sahaba are reciting love poems in the Haram, on the Kaaba. Things that other people think of as secular love poetry, but because they were people of metaphysical insight and intelligence, they realized, no, there's no, uh, love is love. Rumi says, love, whether it comes from this side or that side, in the end it goes to that side. So in, in these love poems that Omar ibn Rabi or these other people would write to a beautiful person here or there, just in their own imagination, they would intuit, they would see the metacosmic reality of he loves them and they love him. They would see God's love in that poetry, in that, in that poem. And they would also see their love for God reflected in that in that poem. And so the, you see this explosion. Hussein's, uh, Sukaina bint Hussein, you know, the daughter of uh, Imam Hussein, would hold poetry salons. She would hold poetry salons. Poets would come, they'd recite poems, and she'd say, yes, this one is good, but you should fix this and do that, and you should change this metaphor. There's a long tradition going back to these early days of the Sahaba and Tabi'in, of people reciting poetry around the Kaaba, and then others coming and correcting them. I say, no, you should do it like this. This would be more fitting. This would be better. The symbolism works better if you do it like this. Like that. So this is something that goes back a very, 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 very long way of not separating out, this is a secular love poem, this is a religious love poem, but rather the poem, if it's a, if it's a good love poem, all of the Sufis will use it and quote it. And if it's a great Sufi love poem, everybody will use it to you know, try to holler at somebody. Um, because it's the same reality of love that's being discussed. When you see, when you see the world in this, as I call it, the 3D way, you see the connections between things out there in the world, things internally, and, and things in God. Uh, then these, po these connections, these metaphors, these symbols that are the stock and trade of, of, of the poetic tradition uh, start to make sense. And if you live in that context, if you grow up with it, if you hear it all the time, if you listen to it all the time, it starts altering the way you perceive the world. All right, so when you see the moon, just like the Quran does this as well too, when you see the moon, when you see the sun, when you see the winds, when you see the clouds, there are all of a sudden all of these associations, this activates this vast network of associations in your head, all of them, if it's really good poetry, going back to God. Uh, his famous verse, in everything there is a sign that indicates that, that he is one. Everything there is a sign pointing back to God. What good poetry does is it connects and arranges things in such a way that all of a sudden they become transparent. You can see them, but you can also see through them. You can see them as tajalliyat, as manifestations of, of uh, divine radiance and, 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 and beauty. And that's why you read these accounts of people, poetry can be so intoxicating. I mean, even today, some places in the world where people are still very sensitive to poetry, you recite a poem, people will fall over. People, I, I know Sheikh Hamza's, I think, mentioned this in Mauritania. If you have Mauritanians are great poets, you say a good poet, it sounds like you punch them in the stomach. <clears throat> this is Senegal and Nigeria, people that you, you, say, you say a good verse, <clears throat> it's, uh, you, it hits. Tomorrow. And it hits, and it's, it's really important because one of the, the great miracles of the Quran, and there are many, but one of the great miracles is the linguistic miracle. And if you're not sensitive to this, the, this power of speech to transform your consciousness, you're not sensitive to the miracle of one of the great miracles of the Quran. Mm. Right? It's like wasting silk sheets on, you know, if your, your body's full of calluses. You can't, you can't, you cannot feel in the silk. You know, you got a cold and you're eating delicious food. You can't taste any of it. People today tend to have colds when it comes to poetic sensibility. Um, clear your sinuses out with some good poetry. <laughs> rinse, rinse it out. Um, and you'll be amazed how your appreciation of what's going on in the Quran um, will change. Particularly because the greatest poets of our tradition, 
Hafiz is called Hafiz because he knew the, uh, all 14 recitations uh, of the Quran by heart. Masnavi is called the Quran in Persian because it's so close to the Quran. It's basically a big commentary uh, upon the Quran. Great Arab poets like Ibn Farid uh, or Shushtari, uh, others, they're constantly reworking Quranic uh, themes and images in surprising ways, which then when you go back to the Quran, you're like, oh, I didn't see that. I didn't see that. I didn't realize every time there's lightning in the Quran, it also comes with this. Um, yeah, yeah, so this, this uh, poetry is... It's it's wonderful, it's uh, it's it's illicit magic, as you know, yeah. as it's, as it's sometimes called. It's kind of punning on 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 on, on the hadith. And if you have poetry, you don't need drugs. You, know, you don't. You can, you can change the way you see the world in a wonderful mm. and, and delightful and, and, and positive way, without ruining your your body or your mind. So you can get really high on poetry. Yeah. Without getting high. Alhamdulillah. Well, you can get high, yeah, high, exactly. high spirits high, elevated. Yeah, spe yeah. Especially, yeah. I, I, I'm Rafa glad Dara you brought that, that, that point up because uh, one of the things is people look at the form of a, of a poem yeah. and then they, they don't understand what, you know, they become a zahiri. Just, this is, oh, they're talking about wine. Generally, khayams, if you, if, uh, if you want to really understand khayams, poetry, whenever the wine comes in, just replace it with ilm, with knowledge. Whenever the wine giver comes in, replace it with the sheikh. And whenever the goblet comes in, replace it with the tools of learning, whether it's a book or something. And see the meaning in that same poem. And you say, oh my God, this, this is the real meaning of it. So they, they portray, because sometimes they say, why didn't they just spell it out? That people say, why don't you tell us what it is? Yeah. Well, that's a whole point because they didn't want their poetry for everybody. They want it for seekers, people who wanted to find because there is a joy in discovery. They wanted you to discover that and have that joy and go through it because everything, like what CD said is everything has a meaning. One of my, uh, you know, there's a Persian philosopher and he said something really beautiful. Uh, he said, there's nothing meaningless in the world. Mm -hmm. He said, even the word meaningless has a meaning that it is meaningless. So everything has a meaning, right? But there's forms in meaning. And what Rumi said, and I think that this really solves a lot of problems in the West, because especially like people like, you know, in marriage, they look at the form of the person, not the meaning of the person. Yara mano show ke surat raftanas. Fall in love with the meaning because the form will dissipate. It will go. You won't have the form. This form, uh, though rosy lips and cheeks within his bending sickle compass come, Shakespeare said, right? Love's not time's fool because time will destroy form. This is the nature of time. Time will destroy everything. What it can't destroy is real love. Real love cannot be destroyed by time. Uh, Every structure that you see, it at one point time will destroy it. At one point they will fall apart, except the structures of love that will stand the taste of the test of time. And this is why Taj Mahal is standing. This is why it's standing still. Because it's made with love. Right? So but forms and meanings is that the essence of poetry. Rumi says, Ay baradar, qissachun paymoneist, ma'ne andar way misalat donaist. So we have, you have what, what they call the paymona and donas. One of, uh, I think I have it here. It's one of my favorite books. Uh, it was just published recently by uh, one of the professor in LA. But he wrote a, a, a book called Paymona with Donna. The, 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 the measuring cup. And that which is inside of the measuring cup, which is the wheat, they usually measure the wheat with the with the measuring cup. And this is from the uh, Surah Yusuf when the the brothers they come, and then he puts the the measuring cup in them, so they they, they get uh, said oh they stole it because he wanted to keep one of his brother Benjamin, he wanted to keep it with him. But anyways, what Rumi says, he says the stories are like uh like the measuring cups. But the meaning of the stories is what's inside the measuring cups, is the wheat or the rice. Donay ma'no bejuyat mard aql nangarat peymolero gargash naql. The men of and the women of intellect they will seek that which is inside of the bowl. 
They will not worry about the form of the bowl if it changes. So if you're thirsty and you're dying of thirst and somebody brings you water, but it's inside this cup that you have never seen, say, no, 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 I, I, don't, want, I don't want that. You, what? You don't want, you, are you drinking the water because of the cup? Mm -hmm. But you're seeking water. Doesn't matter what cup. And then, so then he says, Rumi says, the, if you look for the meaning, کودکان افسانه ها می آورند درج در افسانه شان بس سر و پن so he says all of these children they uh, they come and they tell all these stories like kids they tell you stuff he said if you listen there's lessons that you can learn even from children because there's meaning in these forms something oh it's just a little kid what am I going to learn from him but if you listen you can even learn from little children right that is the big, biggest problem that we have is people look at the form, not at the meaning. People, uh, you know, in marriage, they look, that's why they passes them by. Like the perfect spouse just passes them by, but they don't because they look at the form. We live in the, in the, in the era of form. Everything is just the beauty of the outward, but the inward reality is really, that's what these poets are talking about. That's what Hafiz and Rumi and Saadi, all of, they talk about the inward beauty, right? So, uh, what, uh, Sidi Ola Domini was talking about is that the, there's, there's signs of God, everything. There's the beauty of Allah manifested in everything. So why don't we see it? Why don't we see it? Why, why did Saadi saw it? Uh, you know, he, he saw that. Why don't we see it? Why, you know, Chishti Rahmatullah Ali said, he said, Bahar Chimini Karam, just Khodan Mibina. He said, in everything that I look, I see nothing other than the manifestation of beauty of God. Sifat Zat, to as Ham Judan Mibina. I see the, the, the Sifat of Allah manifesting everywhere. It's all there. You just have to look and see through. But half is said that, you know, uh, the reason why we don't see it because these eyes are too busy looking at the dunya. That's why. We're busy looking at the dunya, but we're not looking at the meanings. So once you see the meaning, what happens when you see meanings? Al-ma'na hu Allah. The ultimate meaning leads to Allah. And this is why we're living in a society where they're trying to remove meaning because they're trying to remove God from society. Because meanings will lead you to seeing the hand of providence everywhere. Because there's nothing meaningless. If it was meaningless, why is it that every leaf of every tree is different? They all could be the same. Why did Allah make it different? Each one is different. Every vine, every line on those, and every tree from the beginning of time till the end of time, none of them have two leaves that are the same. Because there's meaning. Each leaf has a meaning. And this is why in the, when, when Khazan, when this, the, 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 uh, the time of when, when all of these leaves are starting to fall, right? That's why they call it fall, right? The leaves started to fall. Have you ever noticed how the leaves fall? It's like a ballerina. You can see the hand of providence. If you don't see it, there's something wrong that why don't they just fall on the ground in an ugly way? They go like this. And they fall perfectly on the ground. Right? That is because what happens to them? They let go. They let go. And that's what we are supposed to do. And that's what poetry is teaching us. That's what Tasawwuf teaches us. Let go. Let go and trust in Allah. Let go and trust in Allah. You can't get out of it. You can't get out of it. Everywhere. You go, you run into it. You can't run away from it. Fafirru illallah. That's why it says run to Allah. When Zulaikha built this, this uh, amazing chamber and she built it from her own money, not from her husband's money because her Zulaikha's uh, brother was, was a ruler. Or, you know, she came from a kingly family. So she said, send me money. They sent a lot of money. She wanted to build this. They didn't want her husband, the Aziz of Misr, to you know, ask her husband for this because she had a plan for Yusuf Ali Salam. She built this amazing chamber with, you know, Abdullah Ansari said that the doors were over 20 meters long. Like that's amazing. This and they're all made of solid wood and and seven, one, two, three, four, and it just she had a plan. I'm gonna take him in there. I'm gonna lock everything, and he's gonna be mine. 
So he, she took him. He was there in that. Everything, all the doors were locked. And Yusuf alayhi salam saw it as they were leaving. They locked the doors. Behind him, all the doors were locked. But what did Yusuf alayhi salam do in that moment? Did he run away from Zulaikha? If you think about that, that's insanity. How does a prophet run, a, run away from anyone? He didn't run away from Zulaikha. Fafiru illallah. He ran to Allah. Had he run from Zulaikha, the doors wouldn't have opened. Allah opened those doors because he ran to Allah. When you, and this is what Rumi said uh, in the Diwan of Shams. مگو که کار بنده از چی جهاد نظام گیرد خلاق بی جهاد منم there's a, there's a, uh, a beautiful poem that's a munajat that God says when you get stuck don't say oh how is God going to get me out of it because in every direction it's blocked I'm in a place that I'm locked from on, in every direction he said don't say that because Allah says, I'm the creator of directions. You just see left, right, front, back, top, bottom. Just six. But I can make a seventh one. I can make an eighth one. I can make millions of directions for you. I'll get you out. I'll, I'll make a door in the wall for you. I can get you out. And Allah can get you out at any moment as long as you run to Allah. And this is one of the things that poets always teach us is trust. is tawakkal to Allah. That's at the foundation of it. So to see beyond the form and see the meaning, you will have full trust in God. That's the nature of, of a human being. If you see the meaning, you will say, you know what? There is someone who is, Allah is running this whole thing. Allah, and this is why Bullah Shababa said, he said, I'm like a puppet on a string. I tremble at every touch. He realized that he is just like a, it is Allah's doing that. How, you know, Rumi said, uh, you know, he said, it's interesting, Yawmul Alas, uh, you're saying, Alas tu birabbikum, and then you are the one who answered it. And you're saying, Bala Shahidna. <laughs> you, you answer and you, you know you ask and you answer because he's in reality Allah is doing that Allah has given us the, the, the ability to speak right but how do we get to that point of trust to see that through the poetry and what they do the poets first of all having the proper adab second is to see the meaning in the form because it's important to see the meaning in the form if you don't you'll be like everybody on the streets now people are form and do us that well, you know, enjoy it, right? And then you see the poems, you read the wine, I think you think it's the, you know, it's the wine from the liquor store. You see the, you know, uh, the beautiful woman, you think it's the models on, on the runway. No, that's not what they're talking about. They're talking about metaphysical realities that will change your life, that will make you that insanal camel. That's the pursuit of every Muslim and everyone who is on this path of spirituality, to, to come and become the nay, what Mawlana Rumi says is the nay, it's the flute. And the reason why I chose the flute is because flute has three things. One, it has nothing, no attachment in the outside. There's no attachment to the flute. All of, you know, uh, of the Qadr Bedel, they ask him, he said, how did nay get such a high mm-hmm. station? Everybody, every poet is talking about the nay, the nay. He said, as tarke barg, nay ba maqam nawarasi. He said it was the abandonment of the leaves and the beauty on the outward that Ney reached that station. Abandon. No, nothing on the form. Everything is just smooth. No leaves, no flowers, nothing on it, right? And then the second thing is that it's empty from the inside. There's nothing. You have to empty it out. That's the purification of the heart. The UM, but the third and the most important is the holes. And that's the experience of life. And people now, oh, it's, life is difficult. Well, it's trying to drill a hole in you. Be patient, right? If you want to sound good, if you want to become the nay, there's going to be a lot of holes in there. And it's going, to, it's going to be painful. It's going to hurt. But you have to be patient, right? No pain, no gain, like they say in this country. So that's what they're trying to do. So if you want to become that in of Kamil, see the meanings in the forum, walk with Adab, and you know, just be patient with the 
trials and tribulation of life, and you will get to that. And that's what, and, and, and uh, I think that in the, in the logic of the birds, so many beautiful quotes and, and reminders in, in poems about this, this, this beautiful tradition. And uh, I, I wanted to throw it back at you, at this, yeah. this concept that they're teaching in the poetry from seeing the meanings. Uh, you know, abandoning this whole vahiri because it's, it's, I feel like it's an insult to the poet, isn't it? If they just see the bottle of the wine for, for hafiz, like whatever. Yeah, yeah, but you also, it's not one eyed either. So it's, it's um, there, there can be no dhahir without a bottom, you know, bottom without a dhahir, no front without a back. So um, to kind of complement what you're saying, and so in, in, in Rumi's poetry in particular, you, you see this. It's like the ma'ana pushes so hard on the surah, on the form. The meaning pushes so hard on the, on the form that it starts reshaping the form. So I'll give you an example of this. Before Rumi, um, there were something like 18 different meters that they wrote, uh, standard meters, you know, rhythms that they would write Persian poetry in. After Rumi, Rumi expanded the canon of meters to like 50 or something like that. The, the mana, the pressure of the meaning of the inspiration that he was getting impinged on the form. Uh, and with inspired poetry, the form itself is shaped by the meaning. Right? So Ibn al Farid has a nice verse on this. I don't have it memorized, so I'm sorry, I have to look. Lutful al Wani fil Hakikati Tabi'un, le Lutful Ma'ani, wal Ma'ani biha Tamnu. وَقَدْ وَقَعَ تَفْرِيقُ وَكُلُّ وَاحِدٌ فَأَرْوَاحُنَا خَمْرُ وَأَشْبَاحُنَا كَرَمْ This is from his Khamriya, his famous wine poem. So it's like the subtlety of vessels, that could be words or any form, in reality follows from the subtlety of the meanings. But the meanings themselves are enhanced by the vessel's subtlety. It says, things have become separate while everything is still yet one. For our spirits are wine, and our bodies, our forms, are the vine. So he's, he's, he's illustrating what he's wow. doing there too. There's another famous one by this, uh, this like a quote-unquote secular poet, but Raqat uh, al-Zujaju wa Raqat al-Khamru wa tashabaha fatashakkala al-Amru fa ka'annama khamrun wa la kadhun wa ka'annama kadhun wa la khamru The glass was so clear and so was the wine that they became similar and things became unclear, whether there was wine and no cup or cup and no wine. Right? So when these meanings are poured in, if they're strong, if they're true, they actually change the form. And, and so you, you see this wherever, um, wherever the Quran went, the form of poetry changed. First of all, there'd be a big, so like there was not really a big like Sasanid poetic tradition. Persian, Persian poetic tradition before the Quran came there. Right? All of a sudden you get this, you know, the Persians probably more obsessed with poetry than anybody. Persian is one of, perhaps one of the richest languages in the world when it comes to poetry. That happened, despite whatever the Iranian nationalists might want to claim, that happened after the Quran comes. Ferdowsi, you don't get, for all of Sanai, Saadi, everybody, that's after the, the Quran. Same thing, Swahili, Hausa, Malay, it's, it's not like these languages had no poetry before, Turkish, but when the Quran comes, it whoosh, poetry just takes off, and the, the 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 form of the poems are different, and they're shaped and they're changed by the meaning, as well. So the story Yusuf's a good example. Yusuf's not Yusuf combines the you know, the most inward beauty as a prophet, alayhi salatu salam, but he also has half of the beauty of the created world. And so this is what good poetry is precisely that in which the beauty of the inward meaning is reflected in and enhanced by the beauty of the, the forms of the language as, as, as well too. So you actually get, even if you don't understand, so I mean, I don't really understand or do, but I can listen to Kowali and I don't really know what Nusrat is singing, you know, about 60% of the time, but it moves me. I mean, the Quran is the ultimate example of this. People will cry, don't know any Arabic at all. But poetry replicates this on our own kind of human scale as well, where the meanings actually influence and inform the form of the words. And that's part of what makes it so powerful, uh, as opposed to just translating it into a prosaic 
uh, statement. Like, like I, I could say something like, um, I don't know, life is short, so make the most of it, seize the day. But then if you have say something like, falling through our hands like rain, time's precious pearls, too rare to spend on anything but making love, though death is not the end, mm. right? That, that hits different. Same, in a certain sense, you could say it's the same meaning, but it's also not. Once that meaning takes that form, it's something else is going on here. Something else. And th this is where the real magic of, of, of poetry is, is going on, where the, the, f the actual form of the words, the form of the rhythm, the form, it's like music. You can put, you play a song and it makes you feel a certain way. It takes you to a certain place. It's just pure form. There's no words, just pure instrumental music, but it does something to you. And so Rumi said it's, uh, it's an echo of the covenant of a lust. Good music is. The philosopher said it's something from the, from the spheres. Um, but this, the actual form itself, the music, the very music of the poetry uh, is, is part of how the magic of the poetry works. Um, and for thinkers like Ibn Arabi and other, other Sufi thinkers who they kind of situate this in the cosmology in which God says, Kun fa, you know, Kun fa yakun, God speaks the world into being, right? The whole world is speech. The whole world is created through God's speech. Like you're a letter, I'm a letter, this is a word, this is. And poetry is, as you said, ordered speech. God created everything biqadren, with order. And poetry is precisely ordered speech. So the whole world, the whole universe is a poem. So some poets in English, like Amir Suleiman, they say that's why it's called a universe. Right? It's a verse, it's a one, one, one verse. Long. So the whole world is, is, is essentially a, is, is, is a poem, it's ordered speech. And because the whole world is a poem, because of these kind of, and they're more than just creative metaphors, there's an actual, it's kind of how this, this magic works, there's a, there's a correspondence, an effective correspondence between that. So ordered words can affect things in the ordered existential speech. They can reflect them and also affect them, um, which is part of how the magic of poetry works and why it's so effective. I, I, another thing I just wanted to add quickly about the way poetry works is because it has, poetry has a, an actual tangible physical existence. It's breath. Right, poetry is breath. Speech is just cuts in breath. The Arabic word kalima it means a cut. Right, it's a cut in, in breath. So poetry exists on the level of breath, but also exists on the level of images, imaginal, also exists in the realm of the spirit, of pure meanings. Right, so poetry is like us. It exists on all these levels of being. Good poetry, you know, the re real poetry. Um, and that's part of why it's so powerful and why it moves us so much. Good, good poetry, because it exists on all these different levels of being, just like us. So the music of, po of a poem can move you. Just the, like Rumi has as well, more de bodam, zen de shodam, gere shodam, khan de bodam, han de shodam, dole te ishq, al madaman, dole te pa yon de shodam, like that. It's just like you're on a horse and you're galloping and galloping. You don't have to know Persian and you're just, you're going. Yeah. Um, but then you have the, the level of the, the, the meaning of the words, then you have the meaning behind the meaning, and then you have the meaning the behind the meaning layer, behind the, the seven yeah. layers of, of meaning that correspond to the different, our different levels of our soul, of different levels of, 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 of our being. And this is just one of the ways that poetry wow. works and it's, it's so powerful. It, it, it is indeed, and, and then you brought beauty because at the essence of it, uh, poetry is beautiful. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that the poets, they always do is they try to find the most beautiful models mm -hmm. and talk about those. Uh, like the Prophet Yusuf is a good example that is pretty much everybody has something written about him, right? And then also like in, in, if you look at the cosmos, the moon, the moon is constantly in poetry. Like you can't get out of it. Like <laughs> it's probably uh, the most used word in, in, in poetry in terms of anything in the cosmos is the moon because it's so beautiful and it constantly is changing its beauty. It becomes more beautiful when it's smaller. It becomes more beautiful when it's bigger. It's just, it's constantly, it's, there's nothing about the moon that's ugly. So it's every, everything about it is, 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 is beautiful. So like Yusuf alayhi salam and, and the Prophet alayhi salam, obviously, you know, Amir Khusrau, uh, he, uh, you know, uh, he said it because they asked him, <clears throat> that, you know, the poets, they make things more beautiful than they are. Isn't it? If, if they can, then they're not poets. So when you read a poem about uh, a place, 
then you go to that place and like, mm, the poem was nicer than, you know, the, because that's, that's, that's what, you know, that's why they said, give all that money to write poetry in praise of the kings. Why? Because the kings were, okay, they were good or decent or, 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 or great, but they were not like amazing. But the poet just that made them look amazing. Uh, so Amir Khosra, when he, when he uh, you know, uh, the great, they call him the parrot of India, when they asked him to write about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, Ay chehre zibay tu, rashke botana azari, har chan wasfat mi konam dar hus azan zibaytari. He said, oh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, your, your, your beautiful face is, it's, uh, it's the, it, all of the models of the world, they're jealous of you. Like they just, they're like, wow, we, there's no comparison. No matter how much I try to praise you, I still fall short. Even though I'm a poet and I can praise beyond what anybody can do, but I still fall short when it comes to your beauty. And then, and then, so he says, that then when, when you look at the uh, praise of Yusuf Ali Salam, Right? Then you would see like they, the, the poet, they just show this man. You just melt reading the description of, of Yusuf alayhi salam, right? How beautiful he was. But what Iqbal rahmatullah and Mawlana Rumi, they, what they talked about in Saudi, uh, uh, and, and the same response to the beauty of Yusuf alayhi salam, um, because Yusuf alayhi salam was so beautiful. There's a, there's a really a, a thing, and I experienced this myself. I did it. It's called mind over matter. And mind over matter is when, you know, uh, don't do it. I actually walked over fire, but I paid $700 for it. Don't do it. Guys, want to see if it's real or not. So anyways, there's, there's this concept where they get you in this state of complete insanity. Like you're just like, it's just, and then there's the 16, you know, foot long fire, real fire, like charcoal. And, and then you walk over and you don't, you don't get burned. And but in any case, because I did that, I wanted to know uh, after reading the story of Yusuf Ali Salam, the cutting of the hands. Like, how did they cut their hands and not feel it? Right? How did they cut their hands and not feel it? Because when Yusuf Ali Salam walked, into the, this beautiful banquet, all of these women were sitting on the two sides because they were making fun of Zuleikha. So Zuleikha fell in love with her servant, with a slave boy. He said, okay, come. I want to show you who he is. And they sat on the two sides and then she said, bring him in. Open the door and Yusuf alayhi salam walked. And they'll give, you know, she was smart. He gave an orange and a knife. He said, okay, let's cut the oranges. And they were like, they keep cutting and they cut their fingers and start bleeding, but they couldn't feel it. But they keep cutting while Yusuf alayhi salam walked from one side of the room to the other side. He wanted to prove a point. But what the poets really could not describe was the beauty of our Prophet sallallahu They couldn't. They fell short. Because he was more beautiful than Yusuf alayhi salam. And we know that in the hadith. He was more beautiful than Yusuf alayhi salam. And that's what Iqbal said. He said, he said, um, Husni Yusuf to dekar waha katiti ungliya. He said, when they saw the beauty of Yusuf, they start cutting their fingers. Khud chan kat gaya yaha, ungli ko dekar. He said, the moon was cut in half when he saw the finger of my beloved. Shak al kamar. The moon was cut. Just seeing the finger of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That's the beauty of our Prophet. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then Rumi said, he, uh, and, and he was, he said that, um, he said, I'm amazed everybody's talking about Shaq al Qamar. Right? Because of this concept that the Qamar loved the Prophet so much, so much, that we saw the finger. And Rumi said, uh, Qamar is the smartest beggar in all of existence. Because see, the nature of beggars, they come and ask you. But the closer they get, the smarter they are, right? They go to sit at, the, at your feet, please give me. He said, the moon was so smart, he became uh, the beggar that's closest to the Prophet of all the creation, right? In distance, right? He said, Kamina Gada. You know, this is a Gada, this is a beggar, but he came really close. But Rumi says, Dar man dar negar, har dam kamar. He said, if you look into my heart, it's the splitting of the moon at every breath for the Prophet. That 
is really love. That's what they, when they saw the beauty of the Prophet, they fell in love with him. And these things, all of these poets, the reason why their words have an effect on us, because they were really in love with Allah and his messenger. They were really in love with Allah and his messenger. No, it's the phrase in Arabic uh, called Lisan al-Hal. It's the tongue of the state, the tongue of the Hal. And I mean, this occurs even with ordinary things. So, you know, Adele breaks up with her boyfriend. She puts out an album and you can kind of feel, oh, she was really going through it. You can feel it in the music. There's Lisan al-Hal in the music. So you, you, Adele's Hal is contagious through her music, through her lyrics. What of somebody like Rumi? Right, the, Rumi's words... He's, he's in his poetry, his hal is in that poetry, uh, in its forms, in its sounds, in its meanings. And so when you listen to it, when you read it, it can, if you're sensitive, put you back in something that approximates that hal. And poetry, it's odd, it's, I've seen this like pretty much every culture, it's connected to love. You fall in love, you start writing poetry, you start reading poetry. I mean, maybe you've had this experience, you fall in love and the songs on, the love songs on the radio are no longer annoying. They, now now they, they kind of match them, they, they match with your, what's going on in your constitution. And uh, love, love is a kind of melting of the hardness of the heart of, of, of your soul. And when your soul melts like this, like water can take on beautiful patterns. You know, you see the wind going over water, it makes all these beautiful patterns and, and things like that. And then that comes out in your speech as well too. So lovers, the, like, the Hafiz and the Sukhana Ahl Adel, the speech of the people of the heart, the speech of the lovers, tends to be poetry. Tends to be, or at the very least poetic. But it tends to be, when it's at its peak, it tends to be poetry. Yeah. Um, and it tends to then help you get like them, put you in the same kinds of states that they're in. So you can understand. So a lot of this hyperbole uh, that, that goes on with that, they're not just... It's not just hyperbole. It's Rumi saying that you know the 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 my the moon splits every mo every breath in in my heart. He's not being hyperbolic. What he's trying to do is to trying to put what is beyond language in language, and the only way to do that is to break the normal use of language through poetic diction. So I mean, you can even think about this. You have to do this even if uh, you're just describing any experience like a direct experience, something that's not just conceptual, right? So if you have passion fruit, let's say for the first time, or you have a guava for the first time, you're trying to describe what it's like. Just the just ordinary taste of guava. What's guava taste like? If you're trying to describe it to somebody who has never had guava before, you have to say, oh, it's sweet like this. It's something like that. You have to start using similes and metaphors and comparisons. You have to start speaking poetically. And that's just for the simplest, most ordinary dhok experience when it comes to these higher forms of dhok when it comes to love you know, all you have you can't help but speak poetically you yeah. can't help you can't help but speak poetically poetry is the language of love um and in, in in all traditions people who are lovers tend to be poets and people who are good poets uh tend to be lovers and the best poetry or some of the best poetry in my opinion anyway, has been this medih poetry uh, poetry and praise of the Prophet, um, some of the most beautiful verses ever written um, in, in Arabic. I mean, Ibn Mufarad has, I can't remember the Arabic now, but he basically says, if all of the beauties in all of existence were gathered into one figure, that figure on seeing you would say, La ilaha illallah, wallahu akbar. He also said in the same poem, I, I can't remember the, the Arabic as well here, but said, in the art of describing his beauty, time itself expires, and there still remains in him what has not been described. So time will run out before you can describe all, all, all these beauty. And there's a trope in Medih poetry. You praise the Prophet's beauty um, by saying how impossible it is to praise his, 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 his beauty. And again, this is why you have to use po poetry. Is I, I, I argue in the in, in the article, it's kind of barzakh. It's this liminal reality between two different things that unites and separates them. So poetry is like a barzakh between uh, just ordinary prose, speech, and music. Um, it's uh, metaphor is a barzakh between like one thing and another, metaphor and simile, metaphorical speech. You know, if I say 
the hair is like night. There's the hair and there's the night, and the metaphor is the thing that connects the two. It's the, the, the barzakh. Rhythm, all poetry, traditional poetry is metered in one form or another. Rhythm is a barzakh between eternity and time. So it's moving, but it's not moving. Rhyme, and all classical Islamic poetry is rhymed, uh, is a barzakh between one sound and many sounds. And poetry is, as we said, it's made of our breath, and our breath is a barzakh between our bodies and our spirits. That's why so many of our rites, our rituals, are reciting, doing things with our breath. Uh, so poetry has this barzakh equality, uh, which allows it to kind of go in between the spirit and the body, this world and the next, the alam shahada, the alam um, and allows it to synthesize these these seeming opposites together in a way where they're no longer opposites. They're, they're synthesized, they're complements. And that's, that's why the, to, to do the impossible, to F the ineffable, you have to, the only way to do it is, to, is through poetry, is through this amazing gift. SubhanAllah. Uh, also, like, if you don't learn to speak in poetry, don't worry, we'll speak in poetry in paradise. So everybody's speaking yeah. uh, in poetry in paradise because it's a perfection of language. Uh, but uh, I think that just to close here and then we can open for Q&A um, that the foundation of Islamic poetry as uh, our esteemed scholar said is uh, the Quran had played an, a, an extremely important role we had poetry before but it just was the tipping point when the when the revelation came um, and you know, you can't separate the Quran from the Masnavi. It's impossible. You take the Quran out of the Masnavi, you don't have a book. There are uh, 3,000 references to the Quran in a hadith uh, in the Masnavi. So what's going to be remaining in there is, is nothing, basically. So, uh, but the thing that really struck me the most about uh, the poets, especially Mawlana Rumi, is that this... The, the love that they had for Allah and the Prophet yeah. Like this, like, you really, what, what kind of love, like, because we're living in a time that really, you know, we were just talking about it earlier, like, um, he was asking me if I, if I write poetry. I said, I used to write when I was younger, but I stopped and I, you know, Sheikh said one time, Sheikh Hamza said one time, because, you know, this tradition like Persian and, and Arabic, you have these amazing poets that we can read for you know, you can spend your entire life just reading the Masnavi and it's still, you haven't done justice to it. Like you can just read it a, a hundred times over, it's still not enough. Uh, why would you want to write it? They, they, didn't, they didn't leave anything that you, it's okay, we need to write about this. I mean, unless you have, you're like Iqbal, then you can write, you have the right to write uh, poetry. But, uh, but um, for me, is the, just the state that they were in and how they wrote about Allah and the Prophet that is really something that uh, you can't find in, in you, you can't find in this time like people can do that they were at a different time different people and you know what I think that Mawlana Rumi he was uh, explaining the uh, the love of Allah and in, in, in the love of the eternal and the ephemeral because the ephemeral is what that which is expires it expires it just has a limited time and it's done and that's what people say, I fell in love with so-and-so, oh, we broke up. It expired, done, it's gone, move on to the next person, right? But the eternal doesn't expire. The, when you fall in love with Allah, it doesn't expire. And I feel like it's the, you know, what in, in, you know, Father Zusama say in, in, the, in the Brother Karim's of when this lady comes and she can't make toba. He goes, you know, just go repent. He goes, no, no, I've done so much evil that I can't even repent. Is that anything that removes these from me so I can actually go and repent? And, and he says, yes, uh, what removes those is an active love. Is an active love. So what's an active love? And I was thinking about what is an active love? Isn't all love active? Well, no, because when you're asleep, you're not active in your love. If you love somebody, right? You fell in love with a girl, you, you want to get married with her, and, uh, but, it's not active all the time. It's active sometimes. It's on a hibernation sometimes. It's passive sometimes. It's dead sometimes. It's alive sometimes. But what is that active love? And I realize what he's talking about in that, the advice that he's giving, it's an amazing advice. What he's saying is to fall in love with Allah. 
Because the only love that is active is when you fall in love with Allah. Because he, you know, he doesn't sleep. Right? Allah doesn't sleep. He doesn't, you know, uh, he doesn't doze off. He doesn't sleep. There's no moment that he's not active with his creation. Like he's always, you know, Allah is a tawab. He is accepting your tawbah. In other words, he's constantly turning towards you. Right? There's no time that he's not, you're not in the, like, we forget God. We go in the state of ghifla. But does Allah forget us? No. Right? So, and I realized what Mawlana Rumi kind of put this in, in this, this idea. He said, Ishq zinda, Ishq hayya lo yamut. He said, an active love is really a living love that you fall in love with al hayy the one who never dies. That's the active love. Ishq murda misla beta an kabut. But the dead love is the similitude of it is like is like the the spider's web. Well, one thing about a spider's web, it makes its nest from its own nafs. It's all nafs, right? To build the web from your own saliva, from your own nafs, right? And then what does it do? It takes the fly. What does it do with the fly? It sucks the life out of it. That's a nafs love. This is the love of, of, of majority of the people who fall in love is because they want something from you and they want to take that away from you. Right? But real love is what? They want to give. That's a real love. They want to give. And the highest giving is to give yourself. Right? That you give yourself. So he said, Rumi said, then then ask him about, okay, so what do you say about Layla Majnoon? The greatest love story, right? He said, let me tell you what's the difference between Layla Majnoon's love and my love. He said, Farq dar Majnoon o darman in negar. He said, the difference between Majnoon and me is this one thing. He said, both of us are desperately seeking. He's seeking his Layla, I'm seeking my Mawla. Right? But then he said something amazing. He said, should Majnoon waham He said, look at Majnoon and his Layla. Both of them died and became dirt of the earth. They died and they became dirt of the earth. Chok should chokhi, but chok woyu. Woe unto the one who falls in love with dirt. Woe unto the one who falls in love with dirt. Because you become the dirt. And then he said, Har ke boshad aashiqi mawlai man, boshad andar jani man, leilai man. He said to all of these people, and this is why for me, there are people who Rumi loves. There are people who Rumi love, right? If you love, he said, if you want to become my Layla, then fall in love with my Mawla. If you want to become my Layla, fall in love with my Mawla. And then you are my Layla in my heart. So that is a real love. It's an active love. It's a love that you fall in love with the one who never dies, with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because every other love is just, it expires. The love of this dunya, the love of a car, the love of a man or woman, the love of a house, the love of leadership, all of these. And all of these love that we experience in our life, it's supposed to be stepping through to get us to that final love. But you, you have to go through these in the dunya. So you can experience a little bit taste of it until you get to that level where you fall in love with the with al hay layam with the one who never dies. So with that, inshallah, we will. I just want to add one from. thing. So Rumi has the wonderful example where he says, "Love this this kind of ordinary love is like a wooden sword that you give to a child to train, and then you give him the real sword when it's time to go into battle." And Jami, another great Persian poet, and Sufi Sheikh, used to tell when people would come to see him to train on spiritual training. He asked them, have you fallen in love? And if they said no, he said, go, fall in love first, then come back, mm. then you'll be ready. So the reason, I present a slightly different angle on it. It's the same thing, but from a slightly different angle. The reason why I told them to fall in love, the reason why so much Sufi poetry, if you don't know it's Sufi poetry, just reads like really nice romantic poetry and why Sufis would use ordinary, rom good romantic poetry um, in, in that, 
is, you know, the verse in Surah Al-Baqarah that says, you know, there are those who take things as kind of partners, loving them as if with the love of God, but alladhina amanu ashaddu hubban. Those who believe are more intense in love for God. Uh, so the idea is you see like Majnoon going crazy, giving up everything, giving up his reputation, giving up ev- literally everything he owns. If you love, that's Majnoon loving a Layla who is a delimited person. Right, Layla has her limitations. Um, she wasn't very pretty either. Well, well that, that's, that's, as Atar says, that's because you don't have the eye of Majnoon. Somebody, somebody came by and, and said, oh, I want to see, oh, this is where Layla lives? Oh, I want to see this Layla. And then you saw Layla. It's like, this is the one that all these poems have been written about? This is the one that Majnoon gave up everything for? He was like, Layla overheard her and said, it's because you don't have the eye of Majnoon. You don't have the lover's eye. Well, but Majnoon does, I think, drug addicts, you know, if you have any drug addicts in your family or know people, are, they will give up everything, name, reputation, clothes, money, dignity, everything for this, whatever it is, uh, pills, whatever. They'll give up everything for that. And yet, if you believe, you're supposed to be even more intense in your love for God. All of these other things that, that we love, they're like uh, reflections on a window, Right, so if you're a bird and you can fly into the glass, and that can be really bad for you. If you know the reflections on the window, they can help guide you. They can, it's, it's nothing but even, even the thing that is attractive in anything that's attractive. When, when, when the Quran, it's one of the interesting things about the Aleph Lam of, uh, in the divine names. When it says God is the living, it's God is the only, is the living, all living. It says God is the beautiful. It's all beauty is God's beauty. So if there's something beautiful and attractive in something, it's a reflection of the divine. Now you have to have the proper adab with it. Otherwise you're going to be like a poor bird that flies into the window. Right? So it's not embrace the tajalli of Jamal in heroin. No, that's not going to end well for anybody. Right? But you also have to understand that what's attracting you to that is the same thing that's attracting you to Allah. What you see in that, those things that are bad, and this is the way so much of the poetry works, is it will show you, okay, this thing, I know you have these longings in your soul. You're drawn to this, you're drawn to that, you're drawn to this. Let me take those and tie them up and tie them back to their origin and their source so that those longings, those lusts, those cravings, those loves, if you follow them all the way back, it leads you back to God. So... That's why all of these love stories, every, every single Islamic language that I know has lots of beautiful love stories in, in poetry. But they don't say, um, or some of them at the end or maybe at the beginning, they'll be like, this is actually really a story about the soul. And so, but a lot of them, like Layla and Majnoon's stories, is just Layla and Majnoon. Bishar and Hind, Maya and Ghailan, uh, Shirin Farhad, all these other uh, love stories that animate so much of the tradition is because they're meant to show us if these are how people are towards other people, how much more should we be towards God? And love is the same. You have the same things. You're sleepless. You, you can't sleep at night. You're thinking about the person all the time. I remember when I had my first crush, I wrote the, the, the girl's name all over the, all over the page. I was like doing a little dicker of her. Of her. Right? Love has a similar kind of thing. So Aisha Ba'uni, a wonderful Mamluk Arab female poet, says, if you claim to love, then where's the proof? This is what lovers look like. If you say you love God, and all of us, if you're Muslim, you say you love God in one form or another, because you know, that's a condition of belief, right? But then where's your, where's your crying? Where's your staying up at night? Where's your longing? Where's your wasting away? Where's, we know what it looks like when people are in love. If we love God, because love is not just reducible to obedience. If love is just obedience in a relationship, that's, that's not a nice, that's like a prison warden relationship. That's not a nice relationship. Um, if you love God, you should be a lover. You should look like a lover. You should have the same traits that you see in these lovers, but even more so because your beloved is completely non-delimited. It's al-hay, al-qayyum, al-haq. Um, and then the wonderful thing about that love is it's not exclusive. Or, I mean, in a certain sense, it is exclusive, but it's an exclusivity that's all-inclusive. Right? You can love other things for the sake of God. Because they're not even really other things, because what you love in that thing is simply the, the presence of the divine. So, like, the, 
people will ask, why did Sayyidina Yaqub alayhi salam, he's a prophet, why was he weeping so much that he went blind because his son went away? And the answer in some of these commentaries is it was the, it was the, the presence, the closeness, the intimacy he felt with God in the presence of his beautiful son. It was still all about God at, at, at the end. And so this is one of, just one of the many things that poetry has, has taught me in my life as somebody who's trying to be a lover, but the, the importance of being a, a, a lover. And you know, when, when, the, when the Quran tells us to follow the Prophet, what's the condition? In Tuhibullah, if you love God, فَتَعْبِيُونِ So who's the, the followers of the Prophets are, are supposed to be lovers, supposed to follow him in love, and then the, the, the reward or the back and the, the process of that, يُحْبِبُكُمْ Allah, And then God will love you. So it's, it's, it's really, it's, it's, it's all about love. It's really all about love. And the love that animates this poetry is, is meant to show us uh, what love should look like. What love should look like. Because you can get lost in the fiqh stuff. You can get lost in the kalam debates. You can get lost in these things and forget what's, at, what's animating that. What should be the driving force behind that? It's the same thing that's the driving force behind all creation, behind all motion, behind all everything. It's love. And that's something that poetry gets very clearly and very directly. Alhamdulillah. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut into no, no, question time. It's, uh, beautiful. So that's, that, that's what, you know, if you, wanna, if you really want to enjoy life, you just have to fall in love. Mm -hmm. And, and, and what, what the Ustad said, that is the, um, the taste of everything is in the loving that thing. So when you see like a beautiful Persian carpet, because I saw how they were made, these people who make it, they actually love making these carpets. Mm -hmm. And you see that they're into it. Like they, they, they go over, you know, 10 hours working and they like take a break, come and it's all family owned, you know, in their home. But they say, no, no, just look at this flowers coming to, like the flowers coming to life for them. It's, they love doing that. It's, and that's why you can have that carpet and you really, enjoy having the carpet in your house because they do it. But the same thing with everything else is in, and one thing that Iqbal said that really is fascinating uh, that is that uh, he said majority, you know, when, for example, if you look at the prayer, like Salah, a lot of people in, in the, <laughs> in the subcontinent of Ghani tradition, when they pray like their Isha prayer, like, oh, Alhamdulillah, it's done. I prayed. So it's kind of like a burden. That is over. Like, let's just get it over with. And what Iqbal said is, the reason why we are like that, because we haven't, there's no, he said, he said, Sajda ishqo to ibadat me maza atai. He said, if sajda, if this prayer is done with love, it is then that you can taste the sweetness of your worship. You can taste it. It has a taste. Khali sajdo me to dunya hai basa karti hai. Empty, meaningless sajda, everybody can do that. That's easy, right? It's like the football players and the basketball players, when they win, they go to sajda, right? When you get a promotion, he said, those are meaningless sajda. That's the thing that I think that what poets are trying to bring is really to do things with love. Whatever you do in your life, to do it with love because you do it with ihsan, with excellence. And then you enjoy doing that. You enjoy praying. Mm -hmm. Like you're looking forward to the next prayers. You're not like, oh my God, let's get it done with. You're actually sad that the prayers are over and you have, and then you might do some nuffle prayers because you're just so in love with this because now you tasted the, the sweetness of the prayers. So inshallah, with that, we can, uh, do we have time or you want to have Q&A or you want to close it? Oh, okay. I mean, the okay. other thing, God loves yeah. it. God loves it then too. God loves to meet those who love to meet him. God doesn't like, doesn't yeah. like to meet those who don't like to meet him. It's like, you know, if I'm, Excited to get a call from my wife, I'll just sit and, yeah. you know, just sit by the phone and talk to her and not ignore. And when it's time to talk to her, it's time oh, you to talk do? to her. MashaAllah. Yeah, alhamdulillah. <laughs> alhamdulillah. Or, you know. I'm going to get in trouble for that one. No, no. But, uh, but yeah, so with, with, if you reframe that, that's what a lot of the poetry does is it reframes these things which for various reasons have become, people have thought of them as chores or as duties that's or true. things, as opportunities for love. And even for love making, there's all these yeah. amazing things about the back and forth and salah and what that's, what that's, what that's, what that's actually about. And 
if you're in a healthy relationship, you enjoy meeting your, your beloved. Yeah. And your beloved enjoys meeting you. And if that's not the case, then there's, there's, there's something, you know, there's something wrong that needs to be fixed. But one of the ways that it can be fixed is, again, through the poetry. Yeah. It's like some people put music on to get in the mood. Poetry can help get you in the mood for loving God. Writing it, listening to it, reading it, thinking about it. It's, it's like spiritual Barry White, you know, can, can get you in the mood. Yeah. No, that, I, it, I never would have thought that I would hear the word spiritual Barry White at Zeechana College, but we heard it. It's right here. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. <laughs> Uh, and, and it's true, uh, and, and I think personally that one of the things that, that people, I tell people to po memorize poems, and they say, why do you need to memorize poetry? I said, it will come and save you. Yeah, It literally really will true. come at a time mm -hmm. that you're so desperate, you're so broken down, and that line of poetry comes and picks you up, and you're like, oh my God, I really needed this. And so those are, it's kind of like, uh, it's kind of like, uh, uh, you know, those, the, the emergency medicine that yeah. you have and at a time that your blood sugar goes down you just pump it in and then you, you, it revives you so poetry is really like medicine for for your soul and these words they're not just mere words that that they wanted to write to become bestseller like none of these people must know he was right even not written by Rumi he just went in the hall and said all this stuff and his student Chalabi and uh, Faridun Zarkoub just keep writing whatever he said like he didn't know what he was and then after he would come uh come out of the hall and say every time he ate he came out of the hall like he was just like when he ate food and then it would say oh you said all he goes i said all this stuff and then they would edit it with him that if they heard it properly or they wrote it wrong uh but it was these are all inspiration and that inspiration was from being a person a selfless person a person that doesn't have nafs ego desire love of leadership or I'm going to do this for and that was the mistake of, of Rumi's son that he actually thought oh my father's going to be forgotten I got to do this I got to do that I got to do this said, just relax if Allah you know mm -hmm. the great Shirazi poet said that yeah, you know uh, the one uh the one whose heart is alive with the love of God, they never die. Who fall in love, they never die. He said their name are inscribed and in the eternal book of love. That there is this book of love that the names of these people are. And this is why 800 years later, today in Berkeley, California, we're mentioning Maulana Rumi, who was born in Balkh, Afghanistan. You know, what is modern day Afghanistan and died in, in Konya, Turkey, right? Or we are talking about Hafiz Shirazi, who didn't travel. He hate traveling. Uh, <laughs> uh, he just went to a town nearby and then he wrote this Qasida that became like everybody was heartbroken about this. He thought he went to the, to moon or to the Mars or somewhere. He came back to Shiraz. And then there's Saadi who traveled all around the globe, uh, you know, for 30 years. Uh, we're talking about these guys. Uh, 800, 900, 1,000 years later because they, they are the people whose heart came to life with the love of Allah. And once that, it, that's, they be, their name will be inscribed. And 100 years from year, from now, 1,000 years from now, whenever, they, the, till the end of time, you will mention these people because they are people of love and you can't extinguish the fire of love. And Mawlana Rumi said, because it's important to know how they were inspired and what inspired them. He said that uh, that uh, the fire of love, he said, the fire of love came inside of me and burned everything. That was a hail, that was a, a barrier between me. And this is one of the poems that Ustad sent uh, on, on last night, that Hafiz Shirazi, Man, he no. said, Miyana, uh, عاشق و معشوق میان عاشق و معشوق هیچ حائل نیست تو خود هجاب خودی حافظ از میان برخیز he said between the lover and beloved there are no barriers او oh, حافظ you are the barrier get out of the way we become the barrier between us and our creator so to get out of that that way how does it do it so Rumi said that uh, 
عشق آن شعله است که چو بر فروخت هر چی جز معشوق باقی جمله سوخت He said, love is a fire that once its flames started to rise, it annihilates and burns everything except the beloved. So you become pure. And once you become pure, it's the echo of your own truth that, that comes out from your inside. What Sa'adi Shirazi said, He said, this voice, this what we call ilham, he said, it's, it's from the, the mehrab that is inside your chest. That is echoing out. That once you purify yourself and it comes out. And these are words of ilham and inspiration that came out. And we, we can benefit from them now. And we'll benefit from them when we are older. And we'll benefit from them when at seven. We memorize Sa'adi at seven. But we can't understand them at 70. And between the two, we use those poetry of Sa'adi from the, 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 uh, this, the, the first line that, you know, I remember the first line. I was probably like four or five when I mem- we had to memorize the, the uh, Karima. Karima bibakhshay bar halima. That, I remember that from age four or five. And it had different meaning at different stage of my life. It had different meaning when I was seven, eight. It had different meaning when I was meaning when I was in high school. It had different meaning when I was in college. It has a different meaning now. That same poem, because all of there's so much in the poem that it's waiting for you to grow. It's waiting for you to grow, and the meanings keep emerging. Like one time, I remember when I first had my class of logic many years ago. And uh, uh, we did the Isaguji. And after that, I learned all these terms, and I was like so excited. So I went to Sheikh Hamza, and I said, Sheikh, there's so much logic in the Masnavi I'm finding. Yeah. He said, no, they've always been there. You just didn't know logic. And that's what it is. All of these are in there, but we don't know. As you grow the experience of life and the sciences that you learn, you see the meaning emerge in different way. And it's so beautiful to that because these are books for life. You, you know, these, uh, a lot of these books, the Muslim is not a book you read one time. You know, like you don't read that the Nainam are the first 18 lines. I probably, if I say I read it 5,000 times in my life, it's not an exaggeration, right? And it, it for a while it became like a whip, like every day I used to do it because I wanted to get what is the, the seven level. I want to get to the seven layer of meaning of this poem and you get stuck at the first layer or second or the third or fourth and then this excitement of just discovery. So poetry is beautiful and it leads you to beauty and the ultimate beauty in Allah Jamil Yuhabu Jamal. Allah is the beauty. The beauty of Allah, once you start discovering that, you know, it's fana itna hujahu metere zat me e Allah. He said, I will annihilate myself in you, Ya Allah, to the degree that whoever sees me, they fall in love with you. Yeah. Yeah. Right? And that is when you go into the beauty of this poetry, it gets you close to Allah, that you become, you know, uh, uh, and I'll end with this, and Mawlana Rumi was asking, you know, because people give gifts to when they fall in love, that's the nature of lovers, they give gifts to each other. He said, Shukrana do the ishqra, he said, I've seen you give so many gifts out of gratitude and a sign of love for your beloved. He said, isn't it time that you give yourself as the gift? Become the gift. Become the gratitude. That is the highest station, that we become the gift. We become the gratitude. And Mawlana Rumi said that he... He said, I'm not here to teach you about happiness. He said, I became happiness and I became contagious. Everywhere I go, it's happiness goes with me and it permeates. His book, when you open it, it's a, it's a garden of happiness and it takes you to the, to the land of happiness, make you happy from in, inside and outside and brings happiness into your heart, into your soul into your life, into your families. So may Allah give us tawfiq to read these great books Amen. and to benefit from great scholars such as Ustad Ulu Damini who came from a long journey to be with us and we have benefited 
before from him, from his writings, and now being in his presence. May Allah bless him and his family, and uh, may he come back to Zaytun again so we can continue this symposium. I want to thank uh, our uh, beloved director of uh, uh, beautiful Renovatio uh, journal, which uh, everyone should subscribe and read. as a beautiful journal done with so much Ihsan at Zaytun College, and uh, uh, our esteemed scholar, uh, our brother Uli Domini is one of the uh, regular writers, as was mentioned, and we should support uh, reading these and supporting the uh, Ranavashio project as well. Thank you all for joining. Thank you for being here, the students and the friends and family. Until the next time, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you. Thank you.